Top Med Talk. Nick Majerison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. It's a conference highlight chaired by Ramani Munisinger. This panel discussion features Monty Mython. Smith's Medical Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care at the University College London, Chair of the Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine Group and Founding Editor-in-Chief of Perioperative Medicine on the editorial board of the British Journal of Anesthesia and the Founding Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk. Also, Fiona Walker, cardiologist trained in grown-up congenital heart disease and maternal cardiology in Toronto and at UCLH. She's the service lead for grown-up congenital heart disease and the head of the maternal cardiology programme at University College London Hospitals. And she sits alongside Jugdeep Desi, clinical lead, pops and consultant geriatrician at Guy's and St Thomas's NHS Trust. Have a listen and enjoy. I'd like to start by trying to draw together, I think, a theme of what all three of you were talking about, which is um, the... Uh, essential multidisciplinarity of good care, Uh, the aim of uh, looking at healthcare across the system, not just at the knee or not just at the patient coming for surgery, irrespective of their other medical problems and so on. One of the challenges I think we have in the NHS, and I don't know if others in other healthcare systems have the same one, is we get much, it feels like we don't get enough time for that multidisciplinary collaboration to start to take place so we are too busy delivering the day-to-day care of the patient right in front of us to actually do the blue sky thinking that is required to actually collaborate effectively across different teams now you've all met that challenge somehow in your roles what's the what's the secret how do we address that me um i think it's we, we, uh, talking to people yesterday and in medicine it's mainly about building relationships with colleagues that A, you know you can work with and you know who will deliver um, it was why when our cardiac centre moved from the heart hospital to Bart's that I didn't move the pregnancy service it had taken 15 years to build up this collaboration and this team of people that all then end up as experts and the thought of restarting that again uh, I just I couldn't do it um, so I think it's the right people, it's building a team uh, and it's making sure everyone wants to deliver whatever uh, they're doing within that group and then I I think it works I think it's just about the right people joining in and making it good Thank you Chapti? Yeah, I'd probably kind of add to that in that I think that with the challenge of the population that we're now looking after um, I think that we need to have much more of a generalist approach um, so that you actually do kind of understand how each of these conditions interface with one another and it's listening to the patient and different skills in being able to listen to actually kind of what matters to patients. And I still don't think that our undergraduate or early postgraduate training really facilitates that generalist enough approach and people are very fixated on kind of starting to become specialists before they've got a proper grounding in the medicine that's required. So I think that's one of the things. I think we should still be lobbying very hard that people ought to be doing a lot more general um, medical education before they start to specialise. Um, And I think the other thing is, of course, kind of, you know, developing those relationships is absolutely key. And, you know, people are still very protective within their own specialties. Um, And, you know, it's interesting that there's so much work out there, and yet people kind of still kind of go, well, I think this is within my patch as opposed to that patch. Um, And I think we need to really kind of work on breaking that down. We've got more than enough work to be doing together to address this. Thank you. Monty? I think one of the uh, appealing features about the sort of shared decision-making, and it overlaps, I think, with the POPs type of model or other specialist services, is finding somewhere in the system the people who have the time to give the person where their decision-making is much more complicated. You know, 85, maybe 90% of the time, it's pretty straightforward. You know, no problem. But that, that, where they're complex decisions and discussions, someone's got to be cut that time, and it's not quick. And it's, and it's sub-specialised and it takes very well-trained and particular types of individuals to not load the bases because we've all got too much skin in the game otherwise. So you need someone who's a sort of independent health advisor and I think that's evolving. Thank you. So this is a small conference. We'll all get to know each other. So when you take the microphone and ask a question, please say who you are and where you're from. Jim. I'm Jim. Um, <laughs> oh, so, um, 
chin down, I'm, UCLH. I'm very, very interested in the drop-off in enhanced recovery, and, and you um, very briefly mentioned why you thought it happened. And my experience is that um, that what uh, an unintended consequence of it is that people become evangelical, and yeah. uh, there's an, a, a risk of uh, people stopping thinking. And if you're not uh, if you give fluids, if you're giving fluids, or, and if you're not mobilising, uh, you're failing, and, it's, and everyone's stopping things, you know, protocolised. And then the, the secondary thing that happens after that is that some people get burnt. Individual cl- clinicians, be they surgeons, uh, have a bad experience because of a, a lack of, you know, because you have to do this, you have to do this. I know that's not what it means. I, I just wondered if there's any evidence of, of why people have dropped off doing it and, and if there is a, an unintended consequence, is a sort of evangelical, we must do this, we must do this. I, I think uh, part of it is as you reflected. It's the end of one experience. So in other words, if you mobilise patients post-operatively and they're elderly of a particular phenotype, 25% of them will have orthostatic hypotension that is not a receptive to any form of treatment. You can do two things about that. You can mobilise everyone and accept the fact that 25% will have orthostatic hypertension and it will get better quicker if you mobilise them. Or you can go back to what we used to do and leave 100% of people in bed because of the 25% that get orthostatic hypotension. So the protocols and the pathways help to deliver it for the 25%. We get paid the big bucks to protect the 25%. So the 75% is served well by the protocol the 25% is served well by us doing ward rounds and being clever practitioners who can protect the 25%. If you mean. So, but, but I think the wrong thing to do is you stood that gentleman up and he fainted, so don't stand anyone else up again. So no, you should understand the pathophysiology of why orthostatic hypotension happens. And every time you try and mobilise them, it will reduce the period until they don't get their orthostatic hypotension. But you know more about it than I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is really difficult, isn't it? Is that everybody kind of is really enthusiastic at the beginning of change. It gets implemented. We see amazing results. And then kind of over time, that kind of gradually kind of goes back to how it used to be. And you know, I think that's the really interesting thing about how we really implement change in behaviour which is sustainable in the longer term and that's about building in leadership really because often it's that one individual at the beginning who working with a team but driving it and at some point that individual runs out of energy um, and what we need to get better at is that when we are leading our teams is developing that resilience within our teams that when we're flagging a bit someone else in the team is no actually we need to keep this on track and that's partly through data and having run charts up on wards and things like that. So the junior nurses, the physios, everyone can see that on a day-to-day basis and go, oh, actually, we're dipping down again. We need to get this back on track. Getting some competition going between wards often works. You know, it's all of those little things about having the visibility, the resilience, having a focus on sustainability, which is really important. Some of that strikes me as being about um, also... Uh, so it's not just focusing on the doctors, it's focusing on the nurses. I wonder whether the doctors are the right people to actually be leading the delivery of these things because it's the nurses that do most of the actual delivery. They are, I think, in, in terms of their training, better at understanding the importance of protocolised care. Any thoughts on that? Do you have a lot of nurse input into the POPs programme, for example? Is that a rhetorical question around me? <laughs> um, so, yes, we've got lots of um, nurse input into the team, and I think that's absolutely key. This isn't just a doctor's issue, is it? It's a whole team issue, um, and it's a, across the team and across grades and um, disciplines and specialties. Um, so absolutely key to have a multi-professional involvement. But I think you know, junior doctors is the other really important group that we don't focus on because they're there on the wards and it's how we get them engaged in day-to-day delivery, understanding what this means, why it's important, um, and really engaging with them as well as the ward nurses. And, and so that's absolutely key. Thank you. Kay? Okay, Mitchell, Southampton. I think there's also an element that people who are very good at um, bringing new ideas in are often not the people who are good at sustaining them. So maybe we need to actually build in identifying the people who will keep on delivering when those um, 
firecrackers at the beginning lose interest because they've actually got those initial results. Because I think that's often what you see is that you get people who start things up and then move on to the next startup and the next startup and the next startup, but they don't get their team on board to carry on. And, that, and that's where I think the public display of the run charts and compliance with pathways is one of those sustaining elements of it. You know, those whiteboards we have on our ITUs that publicly display our hand-washing rates and how happy people are and our line infection rates. That's part of that sustainability. That, that, that. And the more we can do that with live data sharing, the better I think it will get. Thank you. Um, Ross Kerridge, in Newcastle in Australia. Um, thinking about that quote, asking people what matters, I mean, clearly for most of the population, what matters is the football. Um, and <laughs> Which think, sort, Ross? Yeah, <laughs> Soccer or Gaelic football? Because you're going to be We'll explain that later. <laughs> but, but, but regardless, um, I think, you know, even from the other side of the world, 30 years ago the attention was on George Best and the star players, whereas now we know all about, even as someone who thinks soccer is like watching paint dry, you know, the, the superheroes are Alec Ferguson and um, the coaches. But who are the coaches in hospitals? Do we need them? Mm. Good question. Well, uh, my perspective, it, it's <laughs> clinical, not necessarily physician medical, it's clinical leadership is what I think. Yeah, no, that's right. I think it is clinical leadership, but I think it's also about engaging with management as well. And I think, you know, where we see hospitals which are functioning really well and delivering quality as well as, you know, good financial models is where there's good engagement with management. And I think that's really important and something that we sometimes forget when we talk about the multidisciplinary team is that we don't always think about how we can engage with management to get them to kind of understand what we're trying to do and then supporting us in delivering that, even if it is for a pilot period, to be able to demonstrate change and then look at sustainable change beyond that. So I think it's leadership on a number of different levels. And that's sort of on the principle of invest to save, isn't it? You know, mm. the, if you invest in the clinical leadership, if you give them the time to be able to deliver the project, to lead the project, then mm. that might be effective because none of these services are easy to set up including the including the master mm-hmm. disciplinary cardiology service that you lead Fiona and so that again feels like something that seems to be getting harder because money is so tight in a public healthcare system but are we very good at demonstrating value in that way have you managed to do that <laughs> I, I guess our outcomes uh, demonstrate that, you know, in terms of patient outcomes, are so good. And compared to other countries, as I said, we don't have people sitting on ITU for days or weeks. So most of the time they're treated like any other postnatal patient. So I think, as you say, short length of stay, excellent outcomes in what are a highly complex group. I think that does demonstrate your value, hopefully, mm. <laughs> and having that team. Absolutely. And the same with you, I guess. Yeah, and I suppose we've been trying to do that through kind of the POPs programme that we'll talk a bit more about tomorrow. Um, but recently we've translated the POPs from a you know, very well-running, financially sound hospital at Guy's and St Thomas's to Darrant Valley, which is a struggling district general hospital, and used a very small pot of money, 25000 for a year, to be able to scope out, design and embed the service, which this struggling kind of DGH has then seen the value in that in terms of it being a cost-saving exercise as well as providing quality and decided that actually this is something that they do want to invest in looking to the future and resulted in a sustainable service. Um, but it does require you know, completely different skills to those that we gather when we're going through training and it's about how we use these kinds of forum to really um, learn those skills between each other and share that practice, share business plans and so on rather than everyone going off and writing yet another one themselves and then failing at getting it into practice so you know, we're very happy to share anything like that. And we've got a couple of sessions coming up uh, over the course of today about uh, opportunities in healthcare delivery and, also, and structure and also about quality improvement and leadership for quality improvement which might touch on those points as well. Another question? Hello, my name's Nikki Freeman from Plymouth. Um, I want to just ask you about um, the PROMS data and outcome data and true shared decision making and the fact that very few people knew 
the outcomes after those knee replacements. Mm. I'm just starting out in pre-assessment in that sort of world, and it is, it's a true barrier to shared decision, is knowing what the risks are. Is there an easy way to, to, to find out this information? Is there a centralised resource? Because that would make life a lot easier for lots of people. I, I'm not aware of... I mean, you can... There are centralised resources with regards to mortality, length of stay, readmission rates and starting to get into some of the very major complications. Outside of the PROMS database, I'm not aware of any other resource you may be able to get access to from that perspective. Yeah, I don't think there's a centralised resource for anything like that, but it is interesting as you start to see more and more of these patients, and every time you end up looking things up and starting to find the relevant literature, it's only through that that we found that we were able to look at that. But, you know, similar to knees, you know, we were astounded that people with functional dependency having a TERP, 30% of them kind of are catheter-free at a year, 70% of them are back with a catheter. So, you know, what are, you know, when we're actually doing shared decision-making in that setting as well, um, then without that kind of data available, it's very hard to be able to give risks and benefits to patients. Um, but we haven't be great if we could develop a centralised resource. <laughs> so the PQIP, the PQIP data set will give some information about those longer-term follow-ups, and I'll talk a bit about that later, but... Uh, in some types of surgery that we haven't really looked at it before in. And, and there are healthcare systems around the world that are more fully integrated digital electronic health record single provider systems that are starting to accrue that longer term information, particularly as they switch to being an accountable care organisation. In other words, they own the health responsibility of that patient for life. They're starting to keep track of them for life. So I think it would be reasonable, even if that's in Northern California, for example, the big messages you get from it are probably going to apply to everywhere as a reasonable reference point. You know? And the messages are remarkably consistent and recurring, and it's not all good news. Mm. Mm. Hi, my name is Mel Poole. I'm from South Mead in Bristol. Um, so, just following on from that, really, I had kind of two questions. So, one, if you've had the contact with surgeons that you guys have had and how they have received kind of some of these statistics about risks and whether they completely change their consent process when you um, sort of give them that extra information or how they kind of respond to that if they're kind of actually a bit defensive about it. And sort of secondly, relating to that, um, because you know, surgeons do generally, or certainly in our hospital, but I suspect most hospitals still consent on their own, like not in the presence of a multidisciplinary team. And um, Would you advocate kind of there being sort of national guidelines on what surgeons should be consenting for for common operations. So like knees, so there should be this is actually the general risk that everyone should be being told about rather than surgeons deciding sort of from their personal practice what is reasonable. Um, so, y yes, with um, surgeons, I mean, it's really interesting in that as you work through each of the surgical specialties, how cultures and behaviours are really different. And I don't think I'd quite appreciated that until we started to kind of work across surgical subspecialties. And certainly in some, some subspecialties, they've been much more welcoming of discussing um, kind of shared decision-making, having a shared approach to the consent process, um, and in other specialties, that's been a little bit more difficult. Um, so it's been interesting how it, the cultures vary so much across different specialties. And again, that kind of comes back to what Fiona was saying, was that it's really about building those relationships and gaining trust and having shared um, meetings, drawing up shared guidelines, shared audit meetings, all of those kinds of things that you need to start to build up to be able to develop those relationships. So yes, there are clearly challenges around team working, which aren't helped by the fact that you know, we've constantly told from centrally that we should have one named clinician for each patient, and yet we're all advocating team approaches. So you know, how do you square that, and whose responsibility is that patient, and you know, all the accountability and all of those issues that it raises. Um, so um, yes, different approaches with different surgical subspecialties. In terms of consent, it's really interesting, isn't it? And for example, that in vascular surgery, um, we know that the risk of delirium is about 40%. 
um, the risk of a fatal PE is 0.1%, and yet a PE is always on the consent form, and delirium and cognitive dysfunction is never mentioned on a consent form. And I think, again, that kind of, you know, just really reflects the fact that we've got such sub-specialisation and silo working that people don't kind of, you know, put that all together to think about for the consent process. And again, that comes back to kind of pushing on the team working to be able to do that. There is a further point about that, I think, which is that in the UK, of course, the law has changed quite recently because of the Montgomery ruling. So we are required, or the the surgeon or someone is required to explain to the patient about the risks material to them, of course. And, and of course, a 40% risk of delirium, which we think may or may not have an association with longer-term cognitive dysfunction and so on, is going to be a seriously material risk to most Mm -hmm. patients, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So... um, and I think it goes back to also what you were saying in your talk, Fiona, about having guidelines. You know, guidelines are there to help us, but actually adherence to guidelines and even adherence to big sticks like the Montgomery ruling seems to be... It's very hard to disseminate that knowledge and actually implement it in practice. I guess that's the enhanced recovery experience as well, of the sustainability of that. Yeah, I mean, the little I, I know about that literature and the various different talks I've heard is that education kind of works OK but it doesn't work as well as bribery. (laughs) Bribery is number one most successful methodology. And everyone tells you, no, no, we're all in it for the right reasons, blah de blah de blah The science behind it says being in it for the right reasons, being motivated is pretty damn good. Education is pretty damn good. Bribery beats everything. And by that, I mean, you know, financial incentivisation. Donuts, pizza. (laughs) Pizza. Uh, Mark Chamberlain from Blackpool. Um, Going back to the six Ps, um, I I, I think that's originally a a Sandhurst, a a military thing. Uh, Another of their sayings is that your battle plan rarely survives first contact with the enemy. Are your excellent results because there's a, okay, if this doesn't happen, we do this? Are, Are your plans in that level of depth, or is it, is it possible to, to put a relatively simplistic plan in that will work most of the time? Yeah, they're mainly simplistic. It's mainly, if you understand the pathophysiology of our congenital heart patients in particular, it, you can sort of predict the ones that are going to get into trouble. So if I think somebody might get some degree of heart failure, might get pulmonary edema at the time of delivery because they've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for example, we just give a very simple plan of what to do in the event of Likewise, with arrhythmias, we say in the event of this patient developing arrhythmia, these are the drugs you need to have on labor ward. That was one of the first things that sort of caught me out when I first started, was thinking that labor ward had access to all the cardiac drugs that you might need. <laughs> and actually, you know, you realize there's a recess trolley with very little on it. So it was the pharmacist... Yeah, all the anesthetists laughing heartily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that we, our pharmacist is copied in on these delivery plans. And if we say we need these drugs available, those drugs are then available. I don't know if it happens all the time but that's what we hope most of the time but I think you can predict the the patients that are going to get into trouble so the plan is fairly simple and as I said we're pretty hands off compared to most units to be honest thank you Uh, sorry to have a on that and I think that takes you back to Ross's comment about who's the coach because if those of you have done any sports coaching etc or read sports coaching manuals what Fiona's describing is what coaches do you know they pick a team they have a plan they have a playbook they rehearse it on the paddock but it normally fails on first point of contact unless you're going to trub the opposition. And that's where you come in with your strategy and tactics and you change. That's the cope. That is what they're doing on the pitch there, off the side of the pitch, actually, because you try not to get involved. You don't want really to get your head in a ruck or a wall. You won't be able to spot the next problem. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Hi there. I'm Hina from St. Thomas's and Vascular Anaesthetic Lead, and I work quite closely with Judd Deep. So um, my question is about we're trying to, well, you, you know, we're trying to restructure our aneurysm pathway and patients are coming from all over the country and it's very difficult to get patients in clinic when they're coming from Scotland or Nottingham. So it's really a comment about how do we really achieve good shared decision making when patients are coming from all over the country in a one-stop sort of clinic with anaesthetic input, POPs input, surgical input to achieve real real shared decision making. And I think that is a real challenge with centralisation of services and I'm sure a lot of you are facing the same kinds of issues. I think what we probably need to learn from 
for those kinds of patients is other countries. So Scandinavia has been doing lots of work around gathering information prior to the one-stop service that the patient then attends. And it's about how we gather that the relevant information that we need from the patient's locality before they come to clinic and then having a very structured approach to that clinic so that you know, we've got all of that detail available, the right individuals available for that particular day. So it's the logistics of it which are much more difficult, isn't it, rather than the medicine of it. The medicine of it is just the same. So I think it can still be done in a one-stop way. I think what's interesting with that for us is how much of our time, you know, as consultants in POPs, we spend chasing up relevant information. And we have tried delegating that to our nursing colleagues or the junior doctors or the secretaries, but actually gathering information that makes clinical sense to us requires us to talk to that cardiologist or that renal doctor in that locality. And you can't get those answers because you have very specific questions. So it's interesting how much of our time gets taken up with the admin related to this, um, which is thought to be admin, but actually it's direct patient care, really. It's just done in a different way. And that's been a really interesting thing with our junior doctor program, which actually has just been published in anesthesia today, which is really nice, um, is um, our junior doctors thought that they were doing a lot of admin and hadn't recognised that what they were doing was direct patient care. It was over the phone, not in face-to-face. Um, and it's kind of just reminding people that you know, this is all about patient care. It just takes different formats to do that. So I've got one last question at the back. Hi, Mark Edwards, Southampton. Uh, thanks to you all for a great session. Um, just to jog deep briefly, um, I suppose I'm still struggling to get my head around frailty uh, and what we mean when we talk about frailty. Yeah. To what degree are we collecting together pathophysiological processes we already have identified and know about? Uh, is this just a new framework? Do you think we need to carry on refining what we mean when we talk about frailty? So I've got to say I struggle, Mark, with the concept of frailty as well because, of course, it is a consequence of pathophysiology, psychosocial stuff, all of those things put together to be affecting the state in which patients present to us. So, you know, and I'm a little bit bored of trying to continually refine it now. I think what we need to do is to start to think about how we address those modifiable components of frailty, which clearly require that multidisciplinary, multi-domain approach, but with a very sound evidence-based approach to the medical management of those patients. So, yes, it's a difficult concept. Um, I think it's become a bit of a buzzword that we're using in different settings to say that patients are unwell and at high risk. But what's been good about it is that it's drawn attention to the fact that we need to have a different approach to managing these complex patients rather than having an organ-focused approach to them. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. So that's the end of the session. Please join me in thanking our speakers for a great start. Jerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out Top Med Talk. Com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.